This is a video about fibroids and adenomyosis. My name is Suzanne Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. Fibroids and adenomyosis are two types of common uterine anomaly. It's important to distinguish between them, especially if surgery is being considered. They have specific ultrasound features and they can coexist. Both are common in premenopausal women you sometimes can see a fibroid in a postmenopausal woman, but you need to be very careful not to be misdiagnosing a malignancy. And both can cause menorrhagia, pelvic pain and pressure symptoms, cyclical symptoms and urinary symptoms. The Morphological Uterus Sonographic Assessment Group, MUSA, gave us a common language to describe uterine masses. So fibroids are a circular mass in the myometrium um, consisting of muscle fibres and fibrous tissue with a peripheral capsule. You'll find some peripheral colour Doppler flow, not usually central, though it's not impossible, and some posterior shadowing, which can be dense. There's often calcification in fibroids, and where there's one, there's often others, so do look around for other fibroids. Fibroids tend to be slow-growing. We usually think of submucosal, intramural and subserosal fibroids, um, but we use the FIGO classification to give us a bit more information. So there are submucosal fibroids where they can be all in the endometrial cavity. This is a, um, a fibroid polyp where most of it's in the cavity, grade one, less than half in the cavity, grade two, or this submucosal fibroid just abutting the endometrial cavity all submucosal fibroids. An intramural fibroid is a fibroid surrounded by myometrium on all sides. But you can also have a transmural fibroid and this is again very useful information for a surgeon. And then subserosal fibroids are in contact with the serosa, either a little bit, a lot, or they can be pedunculated. Scan technique for fibroids is to start transabdominally with a comfortably full bladder, using lower frequencies, often without harmonics, because shadowing can make the views poor. You start with a large field of view in case there's a pedunculated fibroid, and then measure the overall uterine size in three dimensions. And then be systematic in describing each fibroid in type, size, location in both planes. And check vascularity with colour Doppler. And if you see a vascular fibroid, then you've got to be very careful that it's not in fact a malignancy. Describe whether or not the endometrial cavity is regular and look for the ovaries. If the uterus is large, the ovaries will often be level with the uterine fundus. So sweep transversely up and down the lateral uterine outline to look for the ovaries. Then always do a transvaginal scan as well with an empty bladder because the views can be really excellent and you can look better at the relationship of the fibroid to the endometrium and look behind the cervix if there's a good mobility and look for the ovaries separately. And always mention whether the bladder empties properly because an acutely retroverted uterus with fibroids can cause urinary retention. So different kind of fibroids are subserosal fibroids this is a, an example of quite a large one, and this is demonstrating uh, this dense peripheral shadowing and peripheral vascularity only. They can be pedunculated, uh, as in this case, where you will play you this little video. This is an adnexal mass, and you can see this is a, a round solid mass. But then scanning in the lateral longitudinal plane, this pedicle appears to the uterus and you can see lots of other fibroids there, all the different kinds, submucosal, intramural and subserosal, they're all visible there. But this is a pedunculated subserosal fibroid and you can see the pedicle just there, pedicle connection between the fibroid and the uterus and there are all the other kinds of fibroids too with the endometrial cavity much distorted by them. And if you put colour Doppler on the pedicle, you can see that there's a uh, good flow. It proves really it's a pedunculated fibroid, but you still need to show the ovary separately. Make sure it's not really an ovarian fibroma. So I went a little bit lower and there you can just see just there 
there's the ovary. So it's much lower than you would have expected, um, but it's entirely separate from the adnexal mass. So that was a pedunculated fibroid. You can have intramural fibroids. Again, this one shows the calcification in the capsule with this dense shadowing, making the views very hard. But in this view, you can see that there's the fibroid and there's myometrium all around it. And this one is nice and clear. Retroverted uterus, endometrial cavity. Here is the fibroid and it is surrounded by a myometrium all the way around, an intramural fibroid. A fibroid can be in contact with the endometrial cavity. And here you have an antiverted uterus. This is the endometrial cavity. And you can see that if you draw a line across this fibroid and the endometrial cavity, because there's the top of the cavity, you can see that less than half of this fibroid is jutting into the endometrial cavity. It's a type 2, submucosal G2. Um, but it can jut in a bit more in the longitudinal plane here. You can see an antiverted uterus. This is the endometrial cavity. This is this hypoechoic regular mass, which seems to be surrounded by endometrium in all, in all directions. Now you go transversely, and you can see again this endometrium um, uh, all the way around and a feeder vessel. So this is a fibroid polyp. And on 3D, it shows up really nicely because this is hypoechoic and the endometrium surrounding it is hyperechoic. So this is a fibroid polyp, submucosal G0. So 3D can be very useful. For instance, in this case, there's a bit of endometrial cavity here. We've got the fibroid here. And on 3D, you can see that the fibroid really just deviates the cavity away, um, but it doesn't uh, alter the regularity of it in any other way. And in this case, you could see nicely that this is a big, low submucosal fibroid, and this is a, a big fibroid polyp at the uterine fundus. So then you need to say whether the endometrial cavity is regular or not. And on this 3D view, you can see that there's an endometrial cavity like this. And this is a bit of endometrium, that's a bit of fluid. And here you can see a large endometrial polyp. It is covered with endometrium, but this was in fact an endometrial polyp. It's a bit of fluid there too. Whereas th this is a submucosal fibroid. You can see that this is a myometrial lesion jutting into the endometrial cavity. So uh, a polyp and a submucosal fibroid grossly distorting the endometrial cavity. So once you've seen uh, a submucosal a fibroid polyp, you can see it nicely on 3D, and this is what it looks like at hysteroscopy. So when they pass a hysteroscope up into the endometrial cavity, you would then be able to see this lesion like that. Fibroids can degenerate. Uh, they can degenerate in pregnancy, typically called red degeneration, can be quite painful. A lipomatous degeneration of a fibroid is painless and uh, is more associated with older people where the lesion would be very echogenic and not very vascular. There's often lots of other fibroids and it doesn't change on follow-up. And after uterine artery embolization, the fibroid can have a starry sky appearance with dense peripheral calcification. And I'll show you some examples. This patient was not pregnant and she had a three and a half centimetre um, intramural fibroid. And then three years later, when she became pregnant at 12 weeks, um, it was now a seven centimetre intramural fibroid. And look how it has degenerated. And it gave us more confidence to know that that was a fibroid because it had been seen previously. They can also undergo lipomatous degeneration, as in this example. You can see that initially it looks a bit worrying, but this is a very hyperechoic sort of fatty tissue. It's not very vascular when you put the colour Doppler on. And this is what it looks like scanning um, live. So in the longitudinal plane going from one side to another, you can see that this fibroid abuts the endometrial cavity, but the endometrium looks very thin in that plane. So this is a myometrial lesion. There's some posterior shadowing. Um, and this is a, a lipomatous fibroid. And when people have had embolization of a fibroid, uh, this in this particular case, this looked like it's six years later. And you can see this uh, dense peripheral calcification. You can see this starry sky appearance. And you can see that this is still a large uterus with a lot of big fibroids um, which have undergone these different kinds of uh, degeneration. <laughs>
whenever we say something's a fibroid, we always worry that we're missing a sarcoma. But I'll just show you how difficult uh, the differential can be. So this is a uterus or part view of part of a uterus. This is how vascular it is when we put the color Doppler on. Normally I use a PRF of 0.6. Um, and then when I um, pressed for the sliding sign, just you can see this is a retroverted uterus to see whether or not there was uh, any movement uh, around um, the lesion. You can see it's reasonably mobile, but this was in fact a high grade lyomyosarcoma. In this example, it's an antiverted uterus, uh, a similar looking heterogeneous uterine mass with vascularity, but it seemed to be uh, less strong, a bit more diffuse. Um, and scanning this patient uh, in the longitudinal plane from one side to another, you can see this antiverted uterus where it's entirely been replaced really by this, by this lesion. Um, and this turned out to be an endometrial adenocarcinoma. And then in this example, again, an antiverted uterus with a very heterogeneous uterine mass. You can't really see any normal myometrium around it as you couldn't in the previous examples strongly vascular including centrally and this is what it looked like scanning in the longitudinal plane from one adnexa to the other and you can again see very similar features irregular and this was in fact a fibroid a benign cellular lyomyoma so quite difficult to tell the difference and basically if you're not sure say so in your report and then arrange follow-up for any mass that you're unsure of so now adenomyosis. So this is a benign mass of endometrial tissue in the myometrium and it's often associated with endometriosis and you need to actively look for this. It's often also associated with congenital uterine anomalies, especially if they cause retrograde menstruation, if there's some blockage. Uh, and it may similarly occur after an endometrial ablation, especially if the woman has got partial regeneration of the endometrium with some dense myometrial adhesions below this regenerated endometrium. And there's basically nowhere for the blood to go um, and it can go into the myometrium. So adenomyosis, it can be focal or diffuse. And if it's diffuse, this causes the, the typically known bulky globular uterus. But you'll often find a myometrial mass with no obvious capsule and very indistinct edges. With colour Doppler traversing through the mass, not peripheral, but the vessels are all the way through. Some very typical stripy posterior shadowing, sort of like light coming through a set of blinds, lighter, darker, lighter, darker. Um, and the lesions are often close to the endometrium with an indistinct endomyometrial junction. You can see myometrial cysts and bright white hyperechoic endometrial islands in the myometrium. This lesion would not be pedunculated and it can be a focal adenomyoma or it can be diffuse adenomyosis. And on 3D it has a very typical appearance and it's often associated with endometriosis. So how to scan for this? You again would start transabdominally with a comfortably full bladder if the uterus uh, appears enlarged or if you've never scanned this lady before. And start with a normal frequency, but you may of course need to adjust this. Start with a normal field of view. Again, if it's a large uterus, you may need to um, come out a little bit. And then measure the overall uterine size and shape and say if it's globular or not. Repeat the scan transvaginally with an empty bladder and then be very systematic in describing the adenomyosis and say if it's diffuse or focal uh, and give some more detail. Check vascularity with color Doppler and describe whether the endomyometrial junction is clearly seen. Always do a transvaginal scan as well because you need to actively look for endometriosis, whether there are ovarian endometriomas and whether there's any deep endometriosis. So you need to specifically look at the torus, uterosacral ligaments, bowel, ureters and bladder. So the difference between a fibroid and adenomyosis is the image on the left. Here I've drawn a little fibroid and here I've drawn some uh, adenomyosis. So this is the mass within the myometrium. This is very close to the endometrial cavity, little cysts and islands of endometrium. A fibroid tends to cause this very dense posterior shadowing, whereas with an adenomyoma you get the more stripy shadowing. 
and with colour Doppler you get circumferential flow typically in a fibroid whereas the vessels cross the lesion um, in adenomyosis. So this is an example of diffuse adenomyosis, it's an antiverted uterus, there's the endometrial cavity and you can see that the anterior wall is much thicker than the posterior wall but that when you put the colour Doppler on the vessels just traverse like that there isn't a peripheral capsule so that again may, would make you think of uh, adenomyosis and then this stripy shadowing you can see how it's darker and lighter it is typical of adenomyosis this case uh, has got uh, lots of features showing really bad adenomyosis so here you can see this is an antiverted uterus you can see a very indistinct endomyometrial junction there are islands of endometrium within the myometrium and you can see these little myometrial cysts and then vascularity throughout the lesion not just peripheral and this is what it looks like um, scanning in the longitudinal plane going from side to side and you can appreciate the findings much better in the moving image so you can see luteal phase endometrium um, and you can see one particular area where you've got these um, myometrial cysts, you've got islands of endometrium in the myometrium, um, severe adenomyosis. And 3D can be quite helpful. This is a, a 3D rendered view of a uterus with these islands of endometrium in the myometrium. Uh, and similarly here, this is a different patient also with a myometrial cyst. This is hemorrhage, uh, as is that. So when you see adenomyosis, you must look for endometriosis, uh, as in this case. Um, there's a little video coming up. Um, you can see that this uterus is bulky and globular, and at least this area here um, contains adenomyosis. So we're going to look for endometriosis. We're going to look at the torus. So this is the bladder, internal os torus. We're going to rotate on that point 90 degrees anticlockwise to look at the insertion of the uterosacral ligaments. And when we're doing that, you suddenly notice how low the ovary is. So if you do nothing else, uh, learn to, to see that. So longitudinal plane, slightly side to side. I'm going to find the area I'm interested in, rotate on it. And this is the torus. This is where the uterosacral ligaments attach. I've got a nice sliding sign on this side. But on this side, you can see the left ovary is attached to the left uterosacral ligament. So in this patient with adenomyosis, she's also got endometriosis. So again, longitudinal plane, find the torus, rotate on it to the transverse. And now you can see the uterosacral ligaments in the sliding sign, nice and mobile there, not mobile there, the ovary glued to the uterosacral ligament. This is another example. This patient again has an antiverted uterus, luteal phase endometrium. You can see islands of endometrium in the myometrium and that gives this typical budding appearance uh, on 3D. What you can also then see when you've di diagnosed her adenomyosis is find her endometriosis. And I'll show you a video. It's going to show you an ovarian endometrioma. It's going to show you a bowel module of deep endometriosis. And it's going to show you deep endometriosis in the ligaments at the torus. So there's the uterus with really bad adenomyosis. And you can see lots of islands of endometrium in the myometrium. There's the um, ovarian endometrioma. There's the bowel nodule and there was the ligaments, uh, deep endometriosis. Just pick out the ligaments again there. And there's the bowel nodule. So very useful to have a really good look in women with adenomyosis. Do they have endometriosis? And quite often they do. Adenomyosis can be related to retrograde menstruation and so in women with a congenitally abnormal uterus or after septal surgery where there's a, a degree of blockage if you like, um, then again uh, you can often find adenomyosis and here you see these islands of endometrium in the myometrium. So this is again a standard rendered view, that's the uterine fundus, the right side, the left side and the, um, the cervix, it's, it's similar to a coronal view. And in this one too, this is a patient after an endometrial ablation um, and there are um, myometrial adhesions across the cavity here and here. And here was a big patch of adenomyosis where you'd had some regeneration of endometrium here 
can't get out that way when they start to menstruate so you can get pressure flow into the myometrium if you like causing adenomyosis they can coexist so in this case a retroverted uterus there's a fibroid and there's the adenomyosis and you can see with the color doppler you've got circumferential flow here with the fibroid whereas with the adenomyosis it traverses the lesion that's the 3D view again of the fibroid. It's uh, almost subserosal. And then here you can see the adenomyosis with the little myometrial cysts as well. And if I just play that as a video, you've got the fibroid there and you've got the adenomyosis there. So you can see the endometrial cavity very clearly, but you can see that the endomyometrial junction is very indistinct. And then you've got this mass just in the um, posterior wall with myometrial cysts. So then in this young girl who came with severe cyclical pain, um, scanning the uterus as a kind of an oblique view, we saw this in one and one side, completely separate from the ovary, and she was not pregnant. Um, looking with color Doppler, there was some circumferential flow, and this looked very much like hemorrhage looking to see is it near the interstitium and this is an oblique view of the cavity and this is the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube and it was entirely separate from that and separate from the ovary so rendering the uterus this is a, an almost normal uterus it's very slightly arcuate um, and then you can of course you can render whatever you like on a 3d view that's the rendered view um, of that lesion which makes it more clear that it's hemorrhage so is it an adenomyoma? This is what's now called an acum, an accessory incavitated uterine mass. And it used to be known as a juvenile cystic adenomyoma. Uh, it's typically in young women with severe dysmenorrhea. And it can, it's important to diagnose because it can be removed laparoscopically and then that's it. It's thought to have been caused uh, by a malarian abnormality with some duplication of tissue at the insertion of the round ligament. And it causes a cystic mass in the myometrium just below the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube. And you do need to have a normal shaped uterus on 3D to make sure you're not misdiagnosing a, a unicornuate uterus with, um, with a rudimentary horn, for instance. Always look at the cervix. Now, a cervical fibroid is rare um, and the cervix is normal with uterine adenomyosis. This is an example of a cervical fibroid. It's a transvaginal image of an anteverted uterus. So this is the anterior uterine wall, fundus posterior, um, and just here within the cervix. So this is where the bladder attaches. So this is the internal os, there's the torus. So this uterus above and it is cervix below. You can clearly see this regular, um, slightly hyperechoic mass in the cervix, in the stroma of the cervix, not in the canal. And it's got some peripheral vascularity and some shadowing. Um, and this is a cervical fibroid. But if the cervix looks abnormal, you do need to at least think about where is the abnormality? Is it in the canal or in the stroma? And if it's in the endocervical canal, it could be a polyp or a prolapsed fibroid. And if it's a prolapsed fibroid, you can often track the pedicle back up into the uterine cavity. But if it's a stromal abnormality, if it's cystic, it could be in the Bothian follicles. But if it's a solid abnormality in the cervical stroma, it could be malignant. And generally speaking, of course, there are a lot of malignant um, differentials uh, in a uterine mass. And you need to think about them and, and try to exclude them by looking for different features. And I've put some little features up uh, here. But of course, there are also some benign differentials. Um, and again, I've got a, a little list of those here. You can always pause the video and screenshot it. So take home messages. It's important to distinguish between fibroids and adenomyosis. They're usually very distinct and have different features. It can be difficult. You need to look transabdominally and transvaginally and 3D can be useful. And if it's adenomyosis, you need to look for endometriosis and follow up any mass that you're uncertain of. Thank you.